Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. Well, I have a big topic to deal with tonight. <laughs> what that means? <laughs> uh, well, I hope so. But I hope it excites some people to go deeper and seek for more. Because it is a, 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 a huge topic and it, it covers a lot, actually. Amen. All right. Well, um, a lot of prayer has gone on before, but I just want to pray again. Father, we just thank you again for your word. We pray that you will minister by your spirit to us and that we will benefit, Lord, from what you would say through your word to us. Lord, fulfill your word not just to us as individuals, but to our city and to our nation. Lord, we pray for Jamaica. We, we ask for divine intervention, God. We continue to ask for the outpouring of your spirit, Lord, that you would strengthen our hearts in the place of prayer. And that we will give the worship, Lord, to you that is due to you. Lord, strengthen us tonight. Help us to hear what you are saying. And help us to walk in obedience that we might benefit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So. I want to talk a little bit tonight about altars and the importance of altars as it relates to the building of our personal lives and the life of our community and the life of our city and nation. And so... I want to begin first by looking at this issue of darkness and light. Darkness and light. God has determined that we should, we should have an understanding of the kingdom that he's a part of. And the kingdoms actually that are, are impacting earth by comparing it to this um, to light and darkness and the relationship between light and darkness one of the things I've learned about physical darkness is that it is not itself an element in other words you can manipulate darkness like how you can manipulate, manipulate light you can turn on and off light but can you turn on and off darkness? No. It, you know, one famous phys physicist, um, I, I think Albert Einstein was a physicist, right? He, was, he studied, right? Albert, Albert Einstein reasoned that, I, I think he was in some kind of argument with his, one of his teachers about the issue of darkness. And he was saying to him that, Darkness really doesn't exist. You know, it's not an element. Darkness is actually the absence of light. Right? And he was using that to say too, that just like how darkness is the absence of light, he says God did not create evil. Evil is the absence of God, right? When we deny or reject or leave our following God, then we end up in darkness, right? And the absence of God is what spiritual darkness is. And so, as we explore the topic of um, altars and what they are, I want to give this a little background, and probably I'm more than a little background, but a background to this important topic. And in looking at 
the kingdoms that are impacting earth we want to just you know remind ourselves because i think most of us as believers are aware of the fact that there is the kingdom of darkness and that there is a kingdom of light and that the kingdom of light is the kingdom which god rules over god is the one who is the source of true spiritual light and those who walk in righteousness and truth you see righteousness and truth is what in the realm of the spirit equates to light righteousness truth and walking in righteousness and truth is walking in the light walking in darkness is equated to walking in um, bitterness and resentment and greed and such things that is evil and that is what the bible refers to as darkness now <clears throat> just to you know make reference to what an altar is very very early in what i'm saying i will just say at this point that a, an altar is a place where the spiritual and the natural or the physical realm actually interact right the altar is a place where the spiritual realm can intervene in the physical realm um, so note i didn't say that is a place where god interacts with man but it is but it is not just god that interacts with human beings in that place but it is a place to where satan and his associates interact with the natural realm it is a portal it is a gateway from the spirit realm into the natural and so when men establish altars they are establishing something that will facilitate the movement of spirits or spirit beings from the spirit realm into the natural now darkness um is a spiritual force in itself you know um i just said that in the natural darkness is not an element but you know when you're um, using an analogy it actually breaks down after a while it doesn't right yeah. in the realm of the spirit um darkness is actually a spiritual force right it is a realm it is a realm in which satan has authority the bible refers to the devil as what the prince of darkness and the prince is a uh, is 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 one of those who has authority a prince has authority over a principality principality is an area a domain and satan has authority in the realm of darkness that is why if you step into his realm he will have authority over you right and he can do things to you if you walk in the light then he can't do what he would want to do to you to get to do things to us you have to tell us some lies get you to believe it and for you to step over from the place of darkness into I mean, from the place of light into darkness. What again? All right. I said, I was saying that Satan has authority in the realm of darkness. He is referred to as the prince of darkness. A prince has dominion over a principality or a area certain particular area right territory and i'm saying that being give, having been given our having authority in that area if we step from that light into darkness he will have authority to do things to us if you walk in darkness you're going to become subject to the devil right 
And so you're going to reap the things that darkness brings, sickness and all kinds of misery. So darkness gives legal authority to Satan to influence our lives if we let him. Right? If we let darkness into our lives, then we are giving Satan authority over our lives. So you find that men <clears throat> actually are caught up in different forms of darkness. There are different um, areas of darkness that we can identify. Three of them that we can identify. I suppose these are the three main ones. Personal, societal, and territorial, right? Personal darkness. Darkness makes it difficult for us to live in line with the purposes of God. And difficult is an understatement, actually. Right? Um, spiritual forces, originally, they were not given dominion over the earth. Who was given dominion over the earth? Man. So those who are operating in the earth um, other than men really are violating the principle that God lays down. They don't have legal authority on earth. Satan doesn't have legal authority on earth except in the realm of darkness. Right? He was not given legal authority. Man has legal authority in the earth. And so for Satan to have access to what's happening in the earth, guess what he has to do? He must use man. And he has to convince man of some lies, which is what he is he, very good at. From the from very beginning, he is the father of lies. And so don't think that you can match him. You know, uh, I don't think you should want to. But he is the father of lies, and he will seek to deceive us. That is how he dealt with Eve. Couldn't do anything until he deceived somebody and get them to do what they shouldn't do. Right? After they yield to him, then he, he gets this authority over them. So scripture says, we become servants to whom we yield our members, servants to obey, Romans, 16, Romans 6, verse 16. So when Eve did that, she was submitting to him, and that is where, well, you know, it, 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 it progressed to Adam. Adam was the one who really, um, you know, things really rested on. It says, it says, Adam was not deceived. Eve was the one who was deceived. Adam ate it with his eyes wide open. Right? So, through Adam, sin came into the world. And the sin brought death. Um, and of course, you know, darkness and death into the world. So, <clears throat> it is man who chooses which spiritual forces he will yield to. We choose. We have a soul, you know. One of the main functions of your soul is your will. Right? Will is one of the functions of your soul. What your other functions are like emotions. You feel emotions in your soul. That's why you say, you know, when you listen to music, you say, boy, you know, it affects me. My soul feels it. Right? That is your soul. Where you feel that kind of thing is in your soul. But your soul has in it volition, will. You exercise your will. And Satan will have access to your life and to the life of your family and community if you yield your will to him. And so we are the ones who actually make the choice. Human beings, they have responsibility. God gave them dominion. They, they yielded their dominion to this entity called, we call Satan, who was Lucifer, light bearer. But we choose, and we are the ones who invite 
evil to come into the spiritual atmosphere where we are. We are the ones who do it. So you, be, you will, as I said before, you will become servants to whom you yield yourself. Right? And that goes for you as an individual or it will go for you uh, um, for, for, for a community, a whole city, or a whole nation. The, the people, um, the character of the people in a nation really betrays what kind of spirit is ruling over it. So darkness brings blindness. Um, it, it suffocates. It, 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 it suffocates the flow of the spirit eh? and spiritual life. It creates hardness of heart, closes the atmosphere from the spiritual atmosphere, from the things of God, right? Darkness does this. It, 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 it blinds us to the truth, right? And when darkness is prevailing, then what will prevail also is what we refer to, or what in the Bible refers to as a closed heaven. Right? And so you find that the things that you used to experience, if you were experiencing God's blessing, are, 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 are prevented, are blotted out. And so you find like in Jeremiah 2 and verse 6, Jeremiah 2 verse 6 to 8, Two, six to eight. See if I can find it. Hmm. Or somebody can find it for me because I had it here or whatever. But I don't see it now. Mm -hmm. read, read it for me, please. What you're going to need to um, read it from here. They did not say, Where is the Lord? who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness. Sorry. Through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed and where no man dwelt, I brought you into the fruitful land to eat its fruit and its good things, but you came and defiled my land and my inheritance you made an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that did not profit. Amen. So... When the heavens close, and all kinds of negative things begin to happen, right? You find that the people are laboring. You labor in vain. You labor. You say, you know, you put. Oh, going Haggai it says, you work on, and put your money in in a bag with holes, right? Rain stop fall, you know, drought, famine in the land. The heavens become like brass, not experiencing God's presence as you did at other times, as it says in Jeremiah. Right? They were they would experience the, the presence of God, but they stopped experiencing the blessings of the Lord because God shut the heavens. And it says in verse 8, the priest did not say, Where is the Lord? And those who handled the law did not do not did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after that after things that do not profit. So what we want is to have an open heaven over our lives, over our community over our city and, and, and how to do that I'm going to get to hopefully tonight at least to begin to look at it how we actually begin to experience 
the open heaven kind of um, experience. Oh. Yep, yep. Well, go ahead. Let me ask it. All right, let me, let me repeat the question. Can a Christian be in darkness and not know? Anybody want to try and answer that one? Can a Christian be in darkness and not know? All right, nobody. Huh? Okay, because the nature of the darkness, if you're in darkness, usually it's because of deception, you know. And the nature of deception is that you, you don't know that you are deceived. Usually, you don't know. Unless, you know, some light shining somewhere and you begin to see it. But, yeah, of course, you can be in darkness and not be aware of it. And, in fact, um, taking it to the extreme, you're talking about a Christian, but I want to make reference to the scripture in Isaiah 60. I know Isaiah 5 says, Isaiah chapter 5, it says that the darkness can be, well, Jesus actually said it. Maybe he was referring to Isaiah chapter 5. He says, there are those whose darkness, I mean, they're in darkness and think that the darkness is actually light. Eh? They're saying, they're actually saying, himself, he says, Woe to those who call darkness light and light darkness. And um, if, you, if, if the light that you have turns out to be darkness, Jesus says, how dark is that darkness? I suppose that is what they refer to in Isaiah chapter 60 as thick darkness. <laughs> I, I don't know, a light thick that translation but but it is gross darkness thick darkness um so so yes the answer to that question is yes um so heavens can be closed closed because we're in darkness because we choose not to follow the way of the lord but as I think all of us know that if we repent, if we turn, you know, um, Second Chronicles 7, 14 makes it so clear that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land, right? So there is hope there. Um, we can repent, we can um, come out of darkness and walk in the light. No, God's original intention, God's original intention is for man to live in his presence. Or I can put it another way, I'll just add one word to it. God's original intent for man is for man to live in the light of his presence, right? God wants man to live. That is how it was in the very beginning, right? God would come down and he would have fellowship with Adam, you know, in the cool of the day, they would have this kind of communion. And God's intent, his original intent, is for man to live in the light of of his presence. God didn't intend for man to rule on his own. Man was not supposed to rule apart from his communion with God. His communion, his, 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 his um, union, his connection with God was what was going to direct his activities and the kingdom of God would be brought to bear on earth because where the will of God is being done, the kingdom of God is being demonstrated or exerted. Right? So God's intent was for man to live in tune with him 
living in his presence and reaping the benefits of his presence, right? The benefits of his presence. What are those? It says the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know, the whole world is looking for peace and joy. And they're looking for it in all of the wrong places. You know, nightclub, party, alcohol, drugs. Um, they're looking for something to satisfy this, this ache that is in the soul that only God can satisfy. But we're looking for it in everywhere, everywhere else, everywhere else. Looking for pleasure, looking for peace. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy, and at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. It's not that God don't want us to have pleasure. God has pleasure that is far beyond any of the physical pleasures that we can experience on earth. And there are physical pleasures that he wants us to enjoy. Right? But we need to, we need to follow his instruction. And we need to make sure that we are giving him what he desires. I hear, it was, uh, Raph said it this evening again. The God who desires or who needs nothing desires something. You know what that is, right? Worship. He needs nothing. He do not need nothing from us. But he desires our worship. Um, and our worship shouldn't shouldn't be motivated by what he can give us. Right? Right? Some of us worshiping because we want a house, a car, a land. And you know we have the prosperity doctrine that tells you that if you give a thousand dollars, you will get ten thousand dollars. And if you give this, you will get this. And that is not what should motivate us in our worship to God. Boy, if we worship God, you know, we'll get all of these wonderful things. And it's true. I, I don't have time to testify tonight, but I could tell you from my own experience, it's true. Right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, you know, Jesus says these things, you know, because some people say all things shall be added unto you. It's not all things. It's all of the needs that you have for your life. And there are actually wants that he will actually survive to supply to. You didn't know that? Yeah, yeah man. Yes. I actually see a scripture that said that. Um, I can't remember it now. But God will bless us when we give attention to him first. Right? We live in his presence. This is what God calls us to, to live in his presence and to reap the benefits of being in his presence in this love relationship where we actually um, experience all the good things that God has for us. I mean, we're spending so much money to get a little peace. And not P I E C P E A C. So it's spell? Yeah. We want what God has for us. Now, <clears throat> it, is, it is a fall that resulted in us gaining this kind of sinful nature. This fall resulted in enmity with God. In other words, we were. We, we are at war with God, right? But there is a way of return. Anytime we go down that negative road, I want to remind us that. There is a, there is a way of return to God. And God has made that way in Christ. He has created this perfect plan that those who have lost communion with God can actually regain communion with God. And this has to do with, of course, embracing Jesus Christ and learning how to worship God in spirit and in truth. 
It is in this place that God gives us power to do his will. Note the worship though. Worship is critical. Worship is, is the place where we draw life from God. And yet it is not the, necessarily the reason why we are worshiping. The reason we call to worship and to this place of worship is, is because God is calling us into a love relationship with himself. He's calling us into the love relationship that is existing between the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It is a, it is a, uh, what do you call it now? It, 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 it is a kind of family thing that God is calling us into. And Jesus was the one who was praying, Father, I want them to love me. I want them to really understand who you are. I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. John what, 17? Right? The ache of Jesus' heart. Those you have given me to be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, the glory that I had with you from before the foundation of the world. God is calling us into this love relationship, this place of worship. But <clears throat> there's this issue of overcoming darkness. That is our challenge. Satan became the prince of the power of the air. And Jesus didn't dispute with him when he said, you know, that he had, he could give, he could give Jesus the whole of the, all the kingdoms of the earth if he will fall down and worship him. Right? And Jesus never disputed with him as to whether or not he had that kind of um, authority or if he actually had that kind of possession. Didn't argue with him because he knew, he knows, he was the one who says, the prince of this world comes, but he has nothing in me. So Jesus acknowledged that Satan is the prince of this world, right? And so we, 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 we have this challenge of um, overcoming darkness. Darkness prevails when we choose to follow our own will. When we follow our own way of thinking, you're going to end up in darkness. Right? It, is, it is the way Satan ended up in darkness. He chose his own will and rebelled against God um, because of his pride. And he got kicked out from his place of abode. You know, Lucifer was a covering cherub, you know, a covering cherub. If you look at the Ark of the Covenant, you see where these angels covering, have their wings over the, the presence of God, right? Um, covering the presence of God, so to speak. That is probably beyond me, you know, what that is all about. At this point in my journey, I don't understand fully how that comes. But he was a covering cherub. You read Ezekiel chapter 28. Um, 1 to 19, you see how he fell from that place. He chose his own way and he fell from his place of abode. Now, spiritual forces of darkness and um, strongholds will bind us. This thing giving me trouble. Yeah, will bind us. They will hinder us. They will harden our hearts. They will weaken our resolve. And they will exert forces that actually push us away from God. Right? They are working to push us away from God. And the longer we stay in darkness, then the more we will lose our godly desires, our things to the desire to pray. The desire to read the word, um, darkness will cause you to lose these desires. <clears throat> Godly desires are going to be affected by the fact that we abide in darkness. And you find yourself becoming less and less interested in the things of God and 
more interested in the things of the world and becoming materialistic and you know just focused on the natural instead of the spiritual even though Colossians chapter 3 says set your affections on things above not on the things of this world you know keep your mind focused on God so the battle to overcome darkness is fought by over seeing what we allow into our minds and into our thinking you know strongholds have their abode in our mind and our thinking your imaginations and all the things right we it it, it what we agree with is going to determine whether we are influenced by darkness or light what you agree with you agree with god or you agree with the enemy and all the narratives out there you know all kind of narrative out there you know i mean as we draw nearer to the end of the age what we're finding is an increasing measure of deception right it is increasing exponentially and it is being aided by technology so we have to make sure that we are grounded in the word of God and that we are consistently renewing our minds. You know, Paul says it, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Be, don't be conformed to this world, this world's way of thinking, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Amen. If you're wondering when I go and get to the issue of altars, this is the background. Important, right? important so bear with me because some people may say well we know that already but some people may not and i just want to make sure we and, and it's good to remind ourselves of all of these things jesus the one who said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free right so there is this this um embracing of truth that we need to consistent consistently be doing if we want to be free and to remain free right truth is key um, true freedom is to be bound by truth you're going to be bound by something you know but if you want you think so people think they're free you know I am a free man, a woman, I can do anything I want. You're not free. You are being directed by thick thoughts and narratives that have been injected into your soul, into your being. And you think it's just your opinion. But all of these people who are singing all of them songs by these DJs, and you think, say, you're free. Right? Those very lyrics are binding your thoughts you know, the, the, these, these, these schools of thought are bringing you into bondage. All right, so there are different types or layers of darkness that we want to highlight. Three layers of darkness. Um, John Molende in his book, he, he highlights three layers of darkness. If you really want to get a good fix on this topic, look for Prayer Altars by John Molende and Mark Daniel. Prayer altars, a strategy that is changing nations. John Molende, Mark Daniels. Or Mark Daniel, Mark Daniel, not Daniels. Right, so if you, <clears throat> um, you're going to overcome darkness, you, you need to understand these layers. You have the personal layer, and uh, I think we know that that is, but let me just say it. The personal layer involves what we submit to, right? What we submit to, what we trust in, and whether we will follow the ways of the world or follow the ways of God, right? Whether we will seek to follow or to do the will of God is very very important um, for the development of our personal spiritual life 
and I'll just go through these quickly. Societal darkness. Societal darkness affects the way society functions. And uh, the, the, there are five um, recognized pillars of society that each can be affected, each of them can be affected by darkness. And I would dare say each of them have or has been affected by darkness. Satan infiltrate all of them because he has infiltrated mankind. So the pillars of society and that I'm making reference to are one, family, the economy, government, and worship, and belief systems. Okay. Say it again, family, the economy, government, worship, and belief systems. Family, we, we, I think all of us know that family is the institution that God himself ordained and really is the bedrock of society, is the foundation of society. And when righteousness reigns in the family, right, um, it affects the whole society. Um, if the family will have function in accordance with the will and purposes of God, then it affects the whole society. Imagine if all families in our city were righteous and following the ways of truth, then, you know, you know, you know, we would have righteous government if you have righteous people, you know, because these people choose government. Right? So when you get an unrighteous, wicked government, it usually says a lot about the people. Right? So pray for the United States of America. We <laughs> have an election tomorrow. Right? So, Family, 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 family is critical, critical. And what happens in the family affects the whole nation. It's like a cell in the body, you know, cells relating to each other and affecting the whole body. It is going to affect um, the security and the health and the well-being of society, the family and whether or not the family will walk in the light or darkness. When, when darkness reigns, the family becomes distorted, dysfunctional, and broken. And when, when that happens, you find um, sexual immorality increasing in the family, right? And, and of course, other immoral behaviors, you know, greed and bitterness and all kind of things working. And, People can relate to each other, and so the, it, it, it affects everybody. The children, the, the hearts of children turn away from their parents, and maybe that's why, it, well, not maybe. The Lord says before he comes back, he's going to send Elijah to turn the hearts of the children, children back to their fathers and the fathers to their children. But rebellion will arise in the family when darkness reigns, and we can see that happening. Right? Rebellion, children disrespecting parents, they no, they have no thing named shame and um, you know and humility. But darkness will bring destruction. Okay? For the economy, the ability to make wealth, you know, the economy, you know, has that um, aspect. The whole ability for a nation to to gain wealth, to learn how to lay hold, I mean hold on it and and to be impacted by that. But if there is darkness affecting the economy, then it going to bring things like greed and selfishness and people walking over each other to get what they want. And I don't care about you. James chapter 3, I think 14 to 15, it says, it talks about um, where there is selfish ambition, 
and something else. No, when the there is bitter envy and selfish ambition, I hope I'm quoting it right, he says, there you will find every evil work. Those two things. Envy, selfish ambition. I don't know how much people grow up in the country, but I hear all these stories of people growing up in the country. And and when when this family next door, children get through them them exams. I mean, people go to all kind of lengths to stop that, you know. Or be a man, witchcraft, all kind of things, because they must not have children that progress more than my own. Eh? And that is a reality, you know. Something is foolishness. But this is what happens when men's hearts are affected by darkness. It brings greed, selfishness, etc., into the society. And bitter envy and and, and, and selfish ambition, those two things, James says. When you have those two things working in any family, community, society, he says you will find every kind of evil work there. Thief, thief, um, stealing, murder, um, fraud, all kind of things. Um, that drives it. When it comes to government now, which is the other one, um, when government is is good, it will take care of its people, right? It gives good leadership. Um, but when there is darkness, you're going to find corruption, oppression, um, and and leading people away from serving God. Right? There's this, you know. Leading people away from God. Um, and then you find people start to worship other things besides God. They start to worship money, you know, wealth, fame, success, getting involved with all kinds of occult activities, um, sorcery. Um, we see that happening in our society, right? Where um, lottery scam. Is not just scamming people, them involved in witchcraft and sorcery. Sorcery is employing, let me clear this up. Sorcery is the employment of evil spirits to carry out your desires. Right? How you employ evil spirits? You offer sacrifices. They require sacrifices, so different levels of sacrifices for different levels of. of um, Different things you want to do. So it can go from offering fruits and vegetables on a table to pigeon to goat to to cow to human. Right? One of the things I believe that is driving murder in this nation is that kind of sacrifice. So boy. And I heard Renata Adams make reference to it. He said, long, long time we know that. Them, 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 have, them have to spill some blood. The, the spirits want blood. So them have to kill somebody. Some of these arbitrary murders that we, nobody don't know why, why they do this. It's initiation merged murder. It is murder to satisfy and appease evil spirits. That one? Missing people, yeah, you don't know where they're gone. Some of them, no doubt, end up in this kind of situation. So, <clears throat> dark, darkness contaminates, it corrupts every sp sphere of society. And uh, instead of welcoming God into the society, we are actually creating a society that is in rebellion against God. And we are opening ourselves to being influenced and even dominated by evil forces. So we can try to fight that, and people try to fight that, like what they're going to be doing tomorrow in the United States. You can try to fight that, <clears throat> fight the unrighteousness that is coming by electing politicians or by protesting against unrighteous decisions. No, I'm not saying that you must elect politicians or protest unrighteous decisions. But if it's that alone you're doing, it's not going to work. 
because the real battle is taking place in the realm of the spirit. The battle for the land only uh, will only be won in the realm of the spirit. Right? You will do all you can. You see what they're trying to do to curb crime in Jamaica? Buy more equipment, and they need to buy more equipment. Need more things, need more people, need more that, that, that. Because the security forces are actually appointed by God to execute vengeance on those who do evil. Romans, somewhere, right? They have that responsibility. And um, Paul said they don't bear the sword in vain. They have authority to use it, right? But they can only deal with the things in the natural. The real issue is in the realm of the spirit and the influence of evil over the minds of men that keeps driving them. It drives the music and it impacts the hearts of our children and then grow up with this wrong, evil narrative in their brain and their souls. And just like I, I heard a video this evening of a woman on a bus, I can't go through the whole thing now, but it was terrible. I mean, one father cussing off the conductor, him and the seven-year-old son, and the seven-year-old son saying, what him we do to this conductress? May we, may we well, floor you and cut your neck and do this and make you bleed out and put the seven year old. Him and his father cursing the conductors. And you need to hear a story behind that because it's just horrible. The story about why they were actually quarreling. You, if, you're on, if you're on WhatsApp, you're more than likely you see it. Or the internet. So, just do, trying to fight in the natural is not going to be enough. You have to influence the minds of people and their thinking. So this is now where the prayer altar is coming at five minutes to eight. Eh? Prayer altars, the building of prayer altars is the means of breaking through the darkness covering the land. And um, next, in our next meeting, I'm going to go in, into more of the details of what the prayer altar really is because the definition of the altar it, it, it really has a number of definitions right in the Old Testament is a physical place in the New Testament is really a heart right so the altar of the Lord if we are going to overcome evil in the land the altar of the Lord must be rebuilt yeah and you have so many examples in the Old Testament of when the people are to come back to God that the altar had to be re rebuilt. You know the story of Elijah? When Elijah appears on the scene and he challenges the false prophets, what is it that he did? Built an altar and challenged them. Say, you build your altar and I'm going to build an altar. And the God who answers by fire, that is the God who we will serve. But the altar was a focal point of this whole activity. Right? When um, God told Gideon, you know, that he was the one that he was going to use to deliver the people, and he said, oh, me? You know? One of the things that God told him to do, go destroy your father's yeah. altars. Destroy your father's the, the altar that was there. He was afraid to do it because he was yeah. going to do that at the risk of his life. So the Lord said, do it in the night. Yeah. And then he built another altar. So when you're dealing with the Gideon story, don't bypass the altar. The altar is a very important aspect of the whole thing. An altar must be raised up to the Lord. Right? So if we are going to overcome the darkness in the land, the altar is what we need to build, right? Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, deal with the territorial darkness. Where am I? Okay.
So the altar must be rebuilt. But let me, let me just deal with the territorial darkness, what that is, before I go on. <clears throat> it says, the ter territorial darkness has to do with principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. Eh? Ephesians 5 talks about that. And I think we, 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 we know about the, the fact that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers of the darkness of this age against principalities and powers and wicked spirits, right? There are such things. So the character of the people will give us insight into what kind of territorial spirit is ruling over a certain region. You know, when I went to Nigeria, and I traveled from Nigeria through a place named Benin, to a place named Togo. After when we were in Nigeria, we had to hold on to our things because if you ever lose, if you ever just take your eye off anything that you have that is valuable, it disappear. In fact, when we, we came in, three of us were on the plane um, going to this conference in Nigeria, and people on the plane were warning us make sure you hold on to your passports very well. And you know, there are a couple, well, yeah. Hold on to it because you will lose it. And when we got into the airport, um, one of the number of us looked like they were, you know, you know, some people think that the Lord is protecting me, so that's not going to happen to me, right? But the Bible says the evil, the, 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 it says the prudent man sees the evil afar off and hides himself. You know, Jesus hid himself sometimes. Jesus, you know. Oh, he himself sometimes, you know, I say, Father, I'm going to take care of me, so nothing can happen to me. Say, take away himself, hide himself because his time was not yet come. So, careful on the thing, say, me big and bad, me can't go anywhere, I'm going to have a trench down, walk down Collis Smith Drive and in the middle of the night, and nothing not going to happen to me because I'm a child of God. Well, Jesus put it this way and said, don't tempt God. You know, jump off because the Lord will catch you. He said, no, no, no. That's how it works. Anyway. Yes. Yes. So she, so she was sitting in the, she sitting in the, um, in the airport. And she put down her, her, her passport beside her, looking in her bag. And then she goes... Nobody knows how she don't see, she know it's gone. Eh? So we leave there and we travel through Benin to Togo. Now, Benin is another place. Benin is like the capital of witchcraft. I remember stopping by, we slowed down and stopped by up the palace of the president or whatever. And the man said, Can't stay here too long, they will shoot us. <laughs> it's like, you don't stop there. Go. So we got to Togo, and in the hotel, everybody put on a briefcase, and uh, them walk off, leave them briefcase, right? And so I'm wondering, you know, you leave your briefcase in, in the, the fire in the hotel, and then walk off and leave it. And I said, top with your briefcase. And the man said to me, we're not in Nigeria anymore, you know. Different place, you can leave your things Leave your car open. The different ruling spirit, so to speak. The place different. Right? You know that I hear if you go to Tokyo and if, if you leave your wallet on a table in the train station and you come back the next day, you will find it. Right? Nobody not taking it. The whole, they're just a different mindset, different. They have a high sense of shame. And then we kill themselves when they're shamed. And the high rate of suicide in, 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 in Japan. They have this, them call it, or, them call it or something. When they take a knife and cut out their stomach. Right? And then think is, is a, is a, is a 
a way to redeem yourself or something like that. Different way of thinking. Right? I'm going to have to end shortly. But I'm going to continue this. But I'm going to try to make sure I have a PowerPoint next time. Right? I was actually trying to work on it and it just wasn't working for this evening. Anyway, um, so territorial spirits will influence the character of the people who live in that area. So when we decide to determine which kingdom will rule over a particular area or region, we have to we have to deal with one personal darkness, the societal darkness, and territorial darkness. Right? We have to deal with those. And we do this by building the altar and drawing the presence of God. Right? And um, this is this is really, really very important. I mean, we don't usually see it from this angle when we're looking at like revival, right? But revivals usually come about because the altar has been rebuilt somewhere, right? It's the altar of worship and prayer. Worship and prayer draws the presence of God, right? And the altar that is raised up for this purpose will draw the presence of God. Without the building and maintaining of altars to God, darkness will corrupt and rule society. Right? When we live without the altar, darkness will rule. If there is nobody praying and there is no worship of the Lord going on in a community, darkness is going to rule. So when, when the Lord comes in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 20, it's 28, 33. It says, the Lord says, I came looking for what? A man who will stand in the gap. What is he doing? He's building an altar. Right? It's to build the altar of worship and prayer. Stand in the gap. Right? And to, where do I say we go again? You look for a man among them to stand in the gap to build up the hedge. 22 to 30 to 33, I think. But I found none. But this has to be done. The altar has to be rebuilt. Somebody has to be praying. Some people have to be praying. The altar must be established. Okay. So, so, so why, why is the altar important? I mean, I've, in that statement I've said it, but we want to break it down. And we will break it down as we go on as to why it is important. We will be looking at holy verses on holy altars. Right? Holy altar is an altar that is manned by the priests of God. Who are the priests of God? We are the priests of God. Right? We are a holy priesthood, a royal pre people, a holy priesthood. Right? We are to offer sacrifices. What are the sacrifices that we offer? Colossians, no, not Colossians. Hebrews 13 from 15, 15 and 16, right? It says, it says, therefore, we should offer continually the what? The sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips, giving thanks. And verse 16 says, and to do good and to share, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So your worship is not just what comes out of your mouth. Your worship includes 
your good works and your sharing. So it's not just what come up, but 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 worship is expressed through our our praise, our thanksgiving, our good works, our sharing. Right? So worship incorporates all of this. So God calls us to man this altar to 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 offer we need to service the altar in the old testament they were commanded to service the altar and they were to keep the fire burning on the altar day and night the fire was not to go out when they built the altar you know you know it was lit fire came from heaven light the altar but when the fire come from heaven and light the altar the priests are commanded to keep the fire burning. On the day of Pentecost, what happened? Fire came from heaven, rested on the, uh, the, the heads. They could see it on the heads, but it's really the heart you're talking about, you know, the fire in the heart. But you now have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to keep the fire burnt. Tend it. You need, we need to discipline ourselves to pray, to read the word of God, um, to worship, to offer the sacrifices of praise, keep the fire burning. They tended it in the morning and I think in the evening. Um, they kept the fire going. They had to keep the fire going. Right? So the fire comes from heaven, but God gives us responsibility to keep the fire burning. All right, I'm going to have to pause here. So I'm pausing at holy versus unholy altars and what we need to do to keep it going. Any questions? Still afraid of COVID? Yeah, um, so, the, so, the, so someone would ask, Rev, so if we have so much churches in Jamaica, um, are you saying that altars have been unholy or not righteous or are these altars being built and maintained in the wrong way? Christian. Christian. All right. So, all right. Well, you know, I can't judge which ones are being serviced properly and which are not. Well, I think it probably would be easier to probably identify some that are doing a lot to service the altar. But the, 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 the truth is that the prayer meeting is the least supported meeting in the church. Right? Say that without reservation or without hesitation. It is the least supported meeting. Some, and then people believe that singing is worship. Singing can be an expression of worship, but if you're just singing, you know, singing, it, you know, you can be singing and not worshiping, because your heart is not focused on God, you know, um, just feel good kind of activity. But the question, yeah, I suspect that we're not all tending to our altars properly, as we should. The altar that is tended to most effectively will influence the society. So if the revival people down the corner is tending to their altar more effectively than the church around the other corner, then you're going to find that the influence is they will have, and it's that's how it works. Um, so in the Muslim countries, right? They know they know where this thing going on. I mean, I, I mean, if there's a there, if you go online right now and put in twenty four seven prayer, I think I think the Christians rival in them now. But I remember putting in twenty four seven prayer trying to get up, and what come up first? Mosque. 
and Islam and the, and 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 they have 24 hour prayer going on I mean in whole different different places and them, their prayer their prayer room is not look like this them have oil and them have this and it is supported by the government so their their prayer house is huge and, and thousands of people walking around I can't remember the middle piece that them call it but they're walking around no no it's in Mecca but this thing in the middle them have a name for it eh? that they walk around and they are praying thousands of them and it keeps on going keeps going keeps going and you wonder why the stronghold in those countries is so effective is what them altar that them attending to in the morning early when I was in Bethlehem in the Muslim section of Jerusalem morning prayers them have loudspeaker yeah you will hear them they say time the call to prayer and then they pray five times a day and even if them on the plane Rosie can tell you I didn't see them but when she was traveling to Israel get them blanket go on the back of the plane put it down I'm praying five times a day so let me tell you the real warfare that is going to take place now at the end of the age is between two houses of prayer God is raising up says my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations and I remember somebody was praying and him said the Lord said to him if my house is not a house of prayer is not my house eh? my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations in the Lord that's Isaiah 56 verse 7 right Jamin right where it says that I'm going to bring Gentiles into my house and I'm going to make them joyful in my house of prayer. Now, I don't know how the Jews dealt with that scripture. But from way back then, the Lord said, I am going to bring Gentiles into my house right? and give them joy in my house of prayer. All right. Some people packing up and they're ready to go. No man, it's good. No, 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 no. You're right. It's all right. I mean, I just, I just given you way to go. Bless you. Thanks for coming. And what you miss, you can get back online because it's still there. All right. Um. So yeah, the tending of. Can you imagine if every church in Jamaica was a real house of prayer? Jamaica would be changed eh? because where you have prayer going on and up persistently and continuously it affects the spiritual atmosphere and it affects the way people think and behave and you know so, so America is in trouble Hollywood will have a lot to answer for because Hollywood has given the the opportunity to influence the whole world for good. What them tell them? Pornography, gender, all kind of things, wokeism, you know, and but there's a lot to answer for. Right? So yeah, we have to pause there. But any other question? We have uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned something about Japan and the, the whole idea of shame there. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Shame, <laughs> that's a good question. Is shame a good thing or a bad thing? You say it's bad? It depends. It depends. Of course. It depends. It depends on what your shame is. You know, the Bible like says that the time when it comes, it says some, there are some people who glory in their shame, things they should be ashamed of, they're glorying in. And when the society reached that stage, you know, so things really gone bad. This is when they start to call evil good and good evil. So the consciences of people have been affected in ways 
that cause them to think, cause them to be. Boy, it's it weird when 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 your conscience. The Bible talks about having an evil conscience, right? When you have a good conscience and you do something wrong, you feel the the conviction of it, or not just conviction, your own heart begin to condemn you, right? And 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 conscience don't argue with you. Conscience just condemns you, right? You feel bad and the conscience saying you did this wrong, 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 wrong. But if your conscience is good, then there is is good. Okay, put say this now. Your shame, you feel ashamed because you did something evil. When your conscience is bad, you feel ashamed when you do something good. <laughs> you know, you think it's a joke? There's a community in this city that I have been in, where if you get the opportunity to steal something and you don't do it, and people know, you run the risk of getting a beaten. That's how they, that's how, that's how their thinking is. Eh? If you have the, I mean, somebody brings pass and a, ten, a bag with $10,000 drop out of it. And you take it up and you go and say you're going to hand it in, you might lose your life. Right, Jamin? Yes, yes. Okay. So what's the difference between shame and guilt? Repeat the question again. What is the difference between shame and guilt? Um it, it, it tied up in what I just said, right? In terms of um shame, I mean Good shame is, is tied to the issue of having a good conscience, right? And the good conscience is, is, is formed by your relationship with the Word of God. Re the Word of God is what shapes the righteous man's conscience. The evil man, how can other things shape conscience, right? Um, guilt and shame. Um, if if your conscience, if if you do something and you're guilty, and it is wrong, you're supposed to feel shame. But you know what's happening nowadays? People are telling society that there's nothing to be ashamed of in doing whatever you want to do. Right? You must do anything you want to do, and you mustn't. You must. You must reject shame. This is a narrative that comes from the worldly way of thinking. I'm thinking you say you must be you must be sexually promiscuous and don't feel no way about it. Don't feel guilty or shame. Eh? But if you are following the word of God, then there that word shame, you hardly hear it anywhere in, in, I, when I was younger. Shame on you. <laughs> and maybe them use it too much, I don't know. But, but, and then them just have this backlash. But there is a place for shame if we do evil. You're supposed to feel ashamed. But then it is the whole tension between what is evil, what is good, and, uh, you know, people trying to, people defining evil and, and, and what is good. Yes, Jacob? Them online. I repeat it. Yeah, yeah, yes. Godly shame leads to repentance. Bad shame leads to death. Yeah. Yes, and after you repent, then you're freed from it. But that whole issue of conscience, Romans 14, is something that's another topic, you know, because you, you can grow up with that conscience that has been shaped a certain way and you can't even eat meat without feeling condemned. Yeah? But the truth will set you free, but it, it don't happen necessarily overnight. Yeah? All right. I'm going to end. 
and um, just just want to pray and pray for us as we end, and we will be finished before eight thirty. <laughs> Amen. So, so Father, we just thank you for the word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any to its sword. And you give us your word, Lord, to shape our lives and to guide our lives and to bring us into blessings and to prosper us. Father, if we will walk in your ways, if we will love you more than we love everything else, then we'll begin to experience the joy and the peace that comes from your presence the pleasures that come from your presence. And yet, Lord, this is not our main motivation. It really is to love you first and to love you best. So teach us how to love you, Lord, to follow after love and to, to, to please you in all that we would do. Teach us how to raise up godly altars, to, to, to have the family altar. Lord, to, to have altars in our churches, our church has becoming an altar of, of worship and praise. And that even the whole city, Lord, you said, Paul says, I would that all, um, all men everywhere should lift up holy hands. Lord, I pray without wrath or doubting. I pray that, Lord, you would convert our city and our nation. Lord, with, to, with, to, to become um, a city of men and women or a nation of women and women who, who can lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting to give worship to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, I pray that you would just bless each person here tonight. Lord, I pray that you would, you would fill us with a divine awareness of your goodness. Lord, you would bring us into new dimensions of grace. Lord, new dimensions of, of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Bless each person. You know, those who may be sick and, Lord, in body are oppressed in mind. I pray for the release, Lord, of your spirit, the power of your spirit to break through all the barriers and to bring release and healing to your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So God bless your brethren. I don't know if they have anything else to say from the, um, those who have announcements or such things. But we will continue this. What is the next thing? Yes, I'm sorry that it's so long. I just feel... I wish it really was every week, but so it is for now. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said I'm feeling next week vibes. <laughs>